Welcome to To Life L'Chaim. On today's program, we're in studio with outspoken Congressman Alan West. Congressman West discusses his views on Israel and why he thinks we're on the precipice of World War III. We'll talk with the Congressman right after these messages. We're privileged to have with us today uh, U.S. Congressman of Florida District 22, yeah. uh, Colonel Alan West. Thank you very much for joining us on Pleasure Life to be Ohio. with you, Lee. Um, there's a lot to talk about since the last time you were here, mm -hmm. uh, and want to get right into it. Um, certainly, in the fall, with the uh, IAEA mm -hmm. reports, um, talked about the disparities. There's great disparities between uh, those reports and uh, how Iran counters those disparities. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do now? Well, I think the most important thing is to continue to keep up the pressure on Iran as well as we have to continue to show greater support to Israel because now it is a critical situation when you know that uh, based upon the IAEA report that Iran is getting closer to militarizing a nuclear device. But it's not just that, it is the concerns that you see with the failure of UN Mandate 1701 in Lebanon and you see uh, Mr. Nasrallah who is the head of uh, Hezbollah there making a lot of uh, saber rattling, 50,000 rockets and uh, missiles that are pointed south toward Israel. We know that things are not well for Israel coming out of Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. The fact that you've had the border crossing between Egypt and Gaza opened up. Uh, Israel is really looking at what could potentially be a three-front type of war and the situation in Syria continues to deteriorate. Uh, and Syria is nothing more than a satellite. So I think that we have to look at that situation and understand how do we continue to put the pressure on Iran but there comes a time when sanctions are just not going to be enough because uh, you have to care about your own people mm -hmm. in order for sanctions to work and you don't have that in Iran. So the military option has to be on the table. I mean, we have uh, a history with Iran of supplying weapons to the Taliban mm -hmm. and killing U.S. troops. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously uh, have a history with them with the uh, Saudi ambassador sure. uh, killing plot and potentially blowing up uh, embassies in this country. Yep. Um, to include the Israeli embassy. Include the Israeli embassy, yeah, correct. Um, when does diplomacy end and uh, action begin? Well, I think you're very close to diplomacy end, and I think that what you're looking at is a modern day Chamberlain Churchill moment where uh, you cannot compromise a peace and negotiate with a, a despot, dictator, theocrat, or autocrat, which is exactly what you have in Iran. And we've been fighting Iran since they took uh, our hostages, took over our embassy back in the late 1970s. Uh, before al-Qaeda came along, it was Hezbollah who had inflicted the most casualties uh, um, against the United States. Uh, and so, you know, there is still a problem with the Iran that is there, and I think that we have to start being a little bit more uh, forthright and saying that, you know, that option of using uh, kinetic uh, solutions is definitely on the table. Do you think Israel has the support and standing within the world community to be able to take that action unilaterally? Well, see, that's the important point. When you think about that little off-camera, off-mic conversation right. between President Sarkozy and President Obama, it is not just the words that they exchanged between themselves, but those words were heard in Iran, in Egypt, in Gaza, in uh, Lebanon with uh, Hezbollah. That causes me the concern whether or not the international community will be there to uh, stand by Israel because they have to take an action. We saw them do that with the nuclear facilities in Iraq and also in Syria. So that countdown is coming. Israel has the capability and the capacity to be able to do it, but it's the second and third order effects mm -hmm. we have to be concerned about. The conservative politicians in the United States talk about uh, how it's the worst relationship between U.S. and Israel in uh, a long, long time. Probably forever, forever. since 1948. Um, the yeah. left talks about how uh, there's great relationships, there's great discussions behind the scenes, the, the support between uh, our militaries mm -hmm. are uh, in sync. Where's the truth? Well, I think the truth is the discussions behind the scenes that we saw with President Sarkozy. And I'll just say one simple thing. How many times has President Obama visited Israel? Mm -hmm. Okay, not candidate Obama, President right. Obama. He uh, definitely went to Turkey. He definitely went to Egypt. That's a concern. So if, we, if Israel has to take that next step, which may be coming soon, um, and uh, what, happens, what happens then? What happens with... Uh, the population, the Islamic population of the Middle East, and uh, they're, they're perhaps 
going against Israel sure. and what's the reaction of Russia and China? Are we heading towards a World War III? Well, I think that you're on the precipice of that. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and like I said, so you do believe we're on the precipice of a World War III? Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, when you look at all the forces that are lining up on one side or the other, it's coming that way. I mean, China is definitely in an economic war with the United States of America and Western civilization. Uh, the Islamic totalitarians are definitely uh, feeling their oats and they're uh, pushing their agenda even further and further. And I think that Iran is a major player in that. It's manifested with uh, non-state, non-uniform terrorist activities, and you see that occurring. Look at what's happening in Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you force uh, Hosea Mubarak to step down, much the same as we did not support the Shah of Iran, and look at the bad things that are occurring there. So I think that right now we need to have a very strong declaration of support to Israel. We need to make sure that we are providing the right material support to Israel as well as moral support. And I think now would be a great time for the president pretty soon to make a, a trip and a visit to Jerusalem and talk about how that is definitively the capital of the modern day state of Israel. And so the people that you talk to, uh, your uh, colleagues, colleagues yeah. what do they say? They say the same thing? They believe the same thing? Well, yes, they do. Uh, but I've, you know, as I talk to some leaders in APAC, the American-Israeli uh, Political Action Committee, we've got to get to a point where we objectively define what does it mean to be pro-Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, you just can't have people saying, yeah, yeah, I am, you know, leave me alone. Uh, you've got to talk about legislation they support, statements that they've made, and things of that nature to show that we really are going to support Israel in this dire time. Because if Israel goes, then the target is clearly on the, the backs of the United States of America. So uh, now is an important opportunity for really the two beacons of liberty, freedom, democracy, the lights in a, a very dark world to, uh, to be recognized and for us to stand forthrightly supporting each other. Well, we have you for the whole show today, so we're yeah. going to take uh, a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the Arab Spring, uh, U.S. Arab Winter, that's what the I Arab call it. Arab Winter, yeah. very good. Uh, yeah. The uh, politics sure. in the United States, uh, Obama standing among the Jewish community. Sure. Um, so we got a lot to get to, and we appreciate you being here. I'm happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Lee. We'll be right back after these messages. We're back with Congressman Alan West. Yes. Uh, pleasure, Congressman. Thanks, Lee. Um, during our last segment, we talked about uh, potentially being on the precipice of World War III sure. with what's going on in the Middle East. How do we pull ourselves back? Or is this the right thing for the history of the world? Well, I think, first of all, we have to come to the recognition that we are on the precipice. I think you have a lot of people at the strategic level of leadership in the United States of America that don't want to see this happening. Uh, Norman Potteritz wrote a book about this, and I read it about uh, three or so years ago. And when you go back and you look at another book that was written by Samuel Huntington, The Class of Civilizations, of Remaking of the World Order, uh, that came out in the uh, mid to late 1990s. So all of these indicators and warnings have been there, but of course, uh, we're not recognizing it. The, the world is really more Machiavellian mm -hmm. than it is what I call Kantian, you know, where we want to try to have, you know, peace and come together on a same type of accord. So we have to understand those things that you're going to have these people that are looking uh, for the means by which that they can have an upper hand in this country. And I think that right now what you see happening is a China that understands that, you know, now you can take a uh, capitalism and use it as a weapon and as a tool and still maintain yourself as a communist country. You see them all over the world looking for raw materials and uh, energy resources. You have Islamic totalitarianism, I think that's a great way to describe it, as manifested through Sharia law and uh, you know terrorist activities that are really becoming that, um, that incredible cancer that's all over the world with non-state, non-uniform belligerence. And then you also have Russia. Uh, let's not forget that uh, Vladimir Putin was KGB, and mm -hmm. he's still KGB. But again, yeah. here they have learned that you can take an energy resource, natural gas, and you can use that as a means by which you can restore your, your country and make it a, a power player. Uh, so here we're the United States of America. We don't want to recognize Islamic totalitarianism. We have a China that owns 27% of our debt. And we have all these energy resources that we have here in America, and we don't want to utilize them. So we're putting ourselves in an incredible box while people are gathering for a storm. So is there a benefit to fighting a major world war right now? Well, I think you may not have to fight what we know is a major world war. I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to be like World War I or World War II. 
but what we have to understand is that we have to defeat those different uh, perspectives uh, piecemeal in and of themselves. We've got to restore our economy and get our economy stronger or else you will see Russia, China, India, uh, Germany and Brazil overtake our you know, economy and that's a part of your, your economic security is part of your national security. We've got to contend with this Islamic totalitarianism that is out there and deal with the various uh, you know, terrorist groups. I mean, we're so constraining ourselves just to talk about al-Qaeda or Taliban. Well, then what about Hamas? What about Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, al-Quds, al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade, Jamal al-Islamiyah, mm -hmm. uh, Abu Sayyaf, we can go on ad nauseum. And then the other thing is, again, we have to start looking at how do we develop our energy resources and get ourselves energy independent so we're not dependent upon all of these different countries like OPEC, which is nothing but a horrible group of uh, despots and autocrats. When we talk about, uh, before the break, we talked about uh, the Arab winter, as, uh, <laughs> as you called oh, yeah. it. And uh, certainly uh, history will, will write the truth, but when we look back on um, the support or lack of support that we gave Hassan Mubarak and, yep. and, and certainly the support or lack of support that we gave towards um, those that were looking to defeat uh, Gaddafi. Yeah. Um, what did we do wrong? What, what could have we have done to change that? Outcome? Well, I think you, you've got a foreign policy that's a little bit schizophrenic. Uh, you know, you had the Green Movement in Iran and we left them out to dry. Uh, one thing that no one is talking about, the fact that when the president said we go to zero troops in Iraq, uh, days after that decision, Masoud Barzani, who's the head of the Kurdish people, decided to travel over to Iran and meet with Ahmadinejad and the Ayatollah Khamenei. Never been done before. Mm -hmm. So you had the Kurdish people, very pro-American, very pro-Israel. And now, you know, for the second time, it seems like we're turning our back on them. In Egypt, very much the same as when we turn our back on the Shah of Iran. You got the Ayatollahs. Now look what you're getting in Egypt. You have the attack on the Israeli embassy. You had Iranian warships going through the Suez Canal. You've gotten the, uh, the border crossing that's opened up. And now you see a new set of riots there in Egypt. Uh, because the Muslim Brotherhood is your strong political entity there, and uh, they're vomiting that uh, un unrest and there's violence. In Libya, you know, the thing is, Muammar Gaddafi was not a good guy. We could have contained him, mm -hmm. but instead we allowed our military resources and forces to kind of be rented out to individuals that we really did not know who they were. Who they were. And two and a half weeks or so ago, we found out the Al-Qaeda flag was flying over Benghazi. But most importantly, we got 30,000 shoulder-fired surface-to-air missiles that are missing. And already we're starting to hear about some of them showing up in the Gaza Strip. That same argument could have uh, held true for um, Hussein in Iraq, too. Mm -hmm. We could have contained him. He was strong, I was, and we could have contained him mm -hmm. as well instead of sending the amount of troops that we sent into Iraq. And see, what I would have done, first and foremost, I would have finished my business in Afghanistan. Uh, where you have a serious problem because the ISI in Pakistan is really playing both sides of the coin. And, you know, Pakistan is almost a failed state. But the, the important thing is there's a failed state that has nuclear weapons there and uh, it's providing sanctuary for terrorist enemies. Has Israel done anything to uh, disfavor their relationship with the United States in your mind? I think the problem is the current president has never had a good relationship with Israel, and I think the current president has a background that is uh, more so uh, in the traditions of uh, an Islamic background, uh, more so of a non-Western civilization tradition. Uh, and I go back to the fact that one of the first things he did as president called uh, Mahmoud Abbas. He did an interview with Al Arabiya. He removed the bust of Winston Churchill from the White House. Those aren't the type of things that uh, a strong ally to Israel or a strong believer in Western civilization would do. But isn't there, you just got to believe that there's career officers that, uh, who do the grunt work on a daily basis uh, in the State Department to maintain the strength of our relationship. Yeah, but what you also have to understand is that if you are the president and you surround yourself with like-minded ideologues, mm -hmm. who's getting your ear? So if there's no one up there to say, you need to go to Israel right now, uh, which in a thousand plus some odd days he has not done. Uh, that is how you show a, 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 a separation or a, a tear in that relationship. And, and once again, I come back to that exchange between President Obama and President Sarkozy. You know, what you say, quote unquote, off camera, off microphone, 
that's probably a window into who you truly are. Right. Well, we're going to take a break right now. We're going to come back. We're going to talk uh, domestic po politics sure. and uh, Jewish support of uh, Obama and uh, your continued candidacy for Congress. Thank you. Great. We'll be right back. We're back with Congressman Alan West. Uh, we're going to talk politics now. Okay. Uh, certainly, Obama carried uh, upwards of 80% of the Jewish vote in, yes. uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, should he carry it in 2012? I don't think you're going to see that happening because now you have policies that people have been able to see. And uh, already we're seeing that uh, support erode down, I believe, in the mid-50s in the Jewish community. Uh, just the same as in the black community, which he carried 95, 96 percent in 2008. Uh, there was a poll taken back uh, late August, early September that said the strongly approved number in the black community that was once 83 percent was down to 58, 59 percent. Because again, you have policies you, that you look at. You look at the fact that unemployment in the black community, 17 percent, black adult males, 20 percent, black teenagers, 45 to 46 percent. Our urban areas are being decimated. And so now the same is with the Jewish community. They can sit back and look and see some of the things that they're not comfortable with. I think that the comment that he made about going back to 67 lines really hurt, even though he tried to clean it up. Mm -hmm. Still, once again, that was not a, a good uh, position statement to make, as well as when you think about why did Mahmoud Abbas come and talk about Palestinian statehood this year was because of a statement that the president made when he gave his speech at the United Nations last year saying that a year from now we will come back and we will have a Palestinian uh, state. So uh, again, those are the type of things that are going to hurt him in the community. So as he uh, begins his campaign for the presidency, uh, as President Obama begins mm -hmm. his campaign for the presidency, what uh, should Jews look at in terms of what he says and his actions? Well, I think the, the Jewish community and all Americans need to really uh, look at this quantitatively and objectify this as far as, you know, you can say you're pro-Israel, but the proof's in the pudding. I mean, what are you doing to say that you're pro-Israel? Uh, because Israel right now is facing an incredible threat and an incredible danger. So what are you promoting uh, as far as your stance to, support that, to show that support? And again, those off-camera words that he said, that's damning. So how do you rectify that? How do you correct it? And the fact that he wouldn't even apologize for saying those things. I mean, I don't know what you have to say to people to, to get them to understand that they should scratch their head. So when you're out in, uh, obviously, the, the district that you represent is one of the most highly populated uh, Jewish mm -hmm. districts in mm -hmm. the United States. So the people who you talk to um, resonate with what you feel as well. Oh, I think that, and as well as there may be people that don't want to ideologically agree with me. But I think that my position as far as uh, my stance and the relationship with Israel speaks clearly for itself. Uh, back in August, we spent a week over in Israel. It's my second visit, my wife's first visit. And the interviews that we had with the uh, Jerusalem Post and several other interviews and the things that I've remained consistent on, I think it speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. You're a lightning rod in Congress. Uh, oh, I don't mm -hmm. know about that. I, I mean, you know, it's interesting when, when you stand on principle mm -hmm. and conviction and you're passionate about things, people say you're a lightning rod, you're, uh, you're controversial, you're outspoken. I think we need to get back to telling the truth to the American but people. But people feel very passionately about you, pro and con. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's how I would characterize a lightning rod, is, it, mm -hmm. is very few people will not have an opinion on you who are, who are politically aware. Mm -hmm. um, so do you enjoy that role? Look, I, I am there to do the best job I can as a congressional representative. I have to be able to look at myself at the end of the day in the mirror and know that I upheld the highest standards of honor, integrity, and character. Now, it's interesting in that you say that the people that vehemently uh, disagree with me, they don't argue about the points. They don't argue about the issues. They don't want to talk about the facts. They just don't like me. Now, uh, I'm never going to win those people over if you don't like me just because I exist. I know that I'm an incredible threat to this present-day Democrat Party because you know, I'm, I grew up in the inner city. I'm not a victim. 
I don't want to be dependent upon government, and, and I don't want to see a government here in the United States of America that really has an overarching rule in the individual's lives. And I think that we got to get back to some simple blocking and tackling principles when it comes to our economy. So me being able to stand up and talk about those things, talk about our debt, talk about our deficit issues that we have here domestically. Uh, if people don't like that, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe they just don't like the truth, but I'm not going to change my uh, standard of telling it. What has uh, been the greatest high in your number of months that you've been in Congress? Every day when I wake up at uh, you know 5.30 in the morning, I go for my nice little five or six mile run. <laughs> and you run by the Capitol, you run down along the mall, you see the Washington Monument, you see the Lincoln uh, Memorial off in the distance. You know, I'm living a great life. Mm -hmm. It's a blessed life to have been able to serve your country in uniform for 22 years, and now you get the opportunity to serve in a suit and tie as a congressional representative. So I can't think of anything better. Every day is a great day for me. Has the lofty view of your ability to get things done, has that, has that been diminished in uh your first year and change of service? No, I think that what we have to come to recognize is that ideological chasm out there that's very wide and very deep. And the American people have to make a decision. Which way do they want to go? Do they want to go uh, back to understand it's a republic, and a republic believes in the rule of law, a constitution, the preeminence of the individual, their rights, their freedoms, their investment, their ingenuity, their innovation will turn around this economy. And we have to have the right type of pro-growth policies that come out of Washington, D.C. Not this incredible, uh, you know, let's just tax everybody to uh, ad infinitum. Uh, because the top 1% pay 38% of federal taxes, mm -hmm. top 5%, 58%, top 25% of wage earners in America pay 86% of federal taxes. That's not the way to go. Uh, it's not about growing Washington, D.C. It's about how do we grow down here on our everyday streets in America. So both sides have that view, it's my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. and, and you're telling the American people that they have to choose. They're going to have to choose because you show me uh, any place in, in the world where a centrally planned and executed economic principle, a, a large mammoth bureaucratic nanny state, has been successful. It has never been. It's always failed. So why do we want to try to have those principles here? As Margaret Thatcher says, socialism works very well until you run out of other people's money. And that's exactly the path that we want to try to take here. And it's interesting because now all of a sudden you see in Greece and Italy and now in Spain, people are moving to more conservative type of government because this, you know, we can provide everything to everyone type of perspective, free health care, free education, free cars, free cell phones. That collapses. Are there any statesmen left in the U.S. Congress? I do believe so. And that's my goal and objective is to become an American statesman a person that stands upon true principles, that is pragmatic in his approach, but passionate and patriotic in the execution of those uh, principles and that pragmatism. So I think that we still do have statesmen, and the United States of America will always produce leaders. Great. Congressman West, it's always a pleasure to have you with yes. us. Will you come back again, sir? Always, Lee. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. That's it for this edition. Don't forget to visit our Facebook page for all the latest news about our program. I'm Lee Lazerson. Thanks for joining us on To Life L'Chaim. <laughs>